Thanks, everyone. Welcome to our AGM. Um, it's amazing, actually, to see so many of you on the call. I really appreciate you being there. Um, we've got a, uh, a stellar show lined up for you. We're going, it's a two-part uh, AGM. Uh, the first part is going to be the, uh, the fun part of the meeting. We've got uh, Joya Mukherjee and Chris Dendies are going to be uh, in conversation and that's going to be uh, very interesting. And that'll last about how long? Um, half an hour, 45 possibly. And then we're going to move into the business part of our meeting, which is where we do our, our usual motions and whatnot for the, uh, the AGM that we have to do to, to maintain our, our uh, society standing. So you're all muted. That's excellent. Um, you, if you, once we get into the Q&A part with, uh, with Joya, there's a chat button at the bottom. Please feel free to use that to uh, ask your questions. I think, Chris, are you going to record this part of the meeting as well in case you want to go back and uh, review it? So that's good. Yeah. Um, what else do I have to say? I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris now to welcome Joya. Thanks. Thank you, Randy. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. This is really inspiring and invigorating and deeply appreciated. So I'm Chris Dendies. I'm the Executive Director of Results Canada. I'm here in steamy Ottawa. I hate to tell you, but it's about 38 degrees. But in any event, I'm, I'm, it's about time also. So yeah, I'm so excited to introduce um, Dr. Joya Mukherjee. Uh, Joya is the Chief Medical Officer of the renowned NGO Partners in Health. Uh, it is an organization that Results has had a long affiliation with and a long partnership with. Uh, here's its miss mission as ripped directly from the pages of its website. Partners in Health strives to achieve two overarching goals, to bring the benefits of modern medical science to those most in need of them, and to serve as an anecdote to despair. An anecdote to despair. I find that incredibly powerful. And along with her role at PIH, Joya is a CNN commentator, a Harvard professor, an award-winning physician and humanitarian who's been on the front lines in the fight for health justice for decades. So with that, why don't I uh, call on Joya so maybe we can switch it to speaker view, or I have to speak mine to speaker view, sorry. And uh, just to say, Joya, thank you for being here. And so maybe we'll dig into to the first question, if that's if that's good with you, does that work for you? Sure. Although that CNN commentator commentator thing makes me laugh because that's only <laughs> that's only because of COVID. <laughs> so. Still, it's yeah. still it's still yeah. powerful. All okay. Right. So, Joya, so Partners in Health has been on the front lines of the struggle for health justice and equity for decades. As I've said, I actually just got a text from Joanne Carter, who is the ED of Results US, who sends her regards and talks about the long affiliation that we have had with Partners in Health as results advocates. Yep. And you've been a champion of human rights and the commitment to leave no one behind for long before it was a catchphrase. Just, you know, speaking of COVID, <laughs> can you reflect on the times we find ourselves in and, and what's at stake and, and share a few thoughts on that? Yeah. So thanks for having me. And we do a Partners in Health. We love results. We've been working with Joanne and chapters all around the country for a long, long time. And I think my introduction to results was in the fight for HIV treatment access, as well as the fight for TB. And with TB, it was particularly interesting to me because it isn't a disease that has a very loud voice. It doesn't have much of an activist community. But results has always, as we have at PIH, tied the prevalence of tuberculosis to poverty. And for us at Partners in Health, we believe that the manifestation of disease is so often, in fact, more often than not, is a thermometer for injustice. Um, and we see this now with COVID. We see that communities that cannot social distance or quarantine are disproportionately affected. Um, and that the weakness, and you are very fortunate, can I say, to be in Canada, uh, the weakness of the American health system, the for-profit aspects, the lack of an umbrella of social protection, 
um, has really shown its ugly head in the face of who gets COVID, who dies of COVID. Um, and so, you know, we've been involved from the beginning in um, the, sorry, my dog's barking. Let me just move, hang on. We like dogs, it's okay. And so we, we've been involved since the beginning in, um, in trying to fight COVID as we would fight other diseases, which is to say, making sure that for every case we find, we assess the material ability to quarantine, to isolate, because differentiate in this epidemic who gets sick and who doesn't. And we see that in meatpacking plants in the United States and prisons um, and in, you know, very densely packed communities. And so, as always, um, and this is what we said with HIV, with tuberculosis, there's no treating these infections without food, right? And so there is no... Um, looking at this from a just an equal lens, you have to have equity, which is really about the search uh, to level and improve and progressively resource those people who need it most. So that's been our, um, our fight for COVID, which is not unlike our fight uh, you know, for treatment of tuberculosis or AIDS or anything, you know, diabetes, cancer, et cetera. Just thank you for that. I, you know, I also just wanted to talk to you about this. There's the individual and the impact. There's this also this, it's a global issue. And for organizations like for PIH and for results, we realize that global problems demand global solutions. And that global solidarity is something that we need to kind of stand up for. It's a given. But there's a feeling like a real tendency, you kind of alluded to it in your country, but also here, I have to tell you, Joy, it's not all, it's not all unicorns and rainbows. That, that there's this movement, this tendency to want to turn inwards, you know, I call it like the me, too, the, the, the me first movement. And do you have any thoughts on how we counteract that tendency and ensure that the global good prevails or even in some examples, some concrete examples yeah. of when we've succeeded that we can draw upon? Yeah. So I'll give you the best and worst examples and sort of a sense of why I pin my advocacy on groups like results and on solidarity. The best example is the global movement for AIDS treatment access. But what we saw is that people living with HIV in the global north and New York and Toronto and Paris stood in solidarity with their brothers and sisters in the global south, in Uganda, in Thailand, in South Africa, and they demanded the right to medicines. And, you know, we're talking now about COVID vaccine and COVID testing. And unless there is a movement that will not be distributed equally as it was not in HIV until the social movement really forced that to happen. And what we see now is globally because advocates fought for the creation of the global fund, um, US money, Canadian money, that 22 million people have access to HIV drugs today, which is remarkable. When I started, it was fewer than 50,000 and antiretrovirals had been available for three years, even when I started at Partners in Health and there was no movement to bring them to the world. Um, so it works when we have solidarity. What doesn't work is xenophobia, racism, and in my opinion, the biosecurity argument. And where I saw that not work well was Ebola. So people put out a fear narrative and yes, some governments put up money and we were able to tackle Ebola, but what we did not do is have a persistent movement. So those countries that were hit by Ebola, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea then and Congo now, have nothing to show for it. So we put out this fire because it was fearful to us, but we didn't build systems for the future. So I'm very leery of the, we need our security and COVID is, you know, any pandemic is, has to be dealt with to protect us. I agree with you, Christina, that this 
me first thing is dangerous to to everyone but particularly to the poor um and so i think solidarity versus you know solidarity justice human rights versus kind of the closed border nationalism um that is the winning strategy is the solidarity side you're on mute I just realized that I'm, I'm giving a fair warning to the to the family, the results family on the line to be prepared with questions I'm going to come to you in a minute. But, um, you know, Paul Farmer, uh, your colleague was recently on CBC doing an interview with ideas. It was a great interview. It was an hour long and I, I, I highly encourage people to kind of go look at it. And he talked about, are we socialized for scarcity? Mm -hmm. Are we being socialized for scarcity? It yeah. really resonated with me because we're being yeah. told as advocates in some ways, don't be tone deaf. There's a lot, you know, there's not enough to yeah. go around. There are people, do you have any reflections on that? I think it is just yeah. so incredibly important as advocates 100%. that we unpack that. Yeah, no. And, and that's something that we talk about a lot at Partners in Health. And I'm glad Paul raised that. Um, we see it everywhere in the world. We see it in, um, you know, a health center, that has been forced to reuse needles. Um, and we see, but we also see it in the richest country in the world, the United States, where we say we can't cover everyone with healthcare. So this is why if we are led by a human rights agenda and the fact that everyone has a right and we as a global community must demand that, the money will be found. There's plenty of money in military budgets. There's plenty of money. And you see, you know, when the stock market goes down, our country races in to prop up companies and everything, but we're not doing the same to people by extending unemployment, by making sure they have health care. So the money is there. It's just not being used appropriately. And so the only way to hold politicians accountable for these flows of capital is through organizing, which is exactly what, you know, results is trying to do grassroots organizing and really presenting the issues, anti-poverty issues to people so that they can see why this is so important. Thanks, Joya. Um, do you, I'm just going to give look to the room and see if there are any questions that uh, that you have for Joya as I uh, reflect a little bit more on this last point that you've articulated, Joya, about just the the power of advocacy. I mean, I think it is, you know, we're also trying to recruit folks to our cause. A lot of the people on this call get it, um, but I just have curiosity. It's sometimes easier to communicate the 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 one inoculation at a time, but the power of advocacy in terms of building the movement it's a little bit harder. And just again, maybe a couple of reflections. Uh, I know you've already mm -hmm. spoken to it, but just the importance of civil society at this important time in history, mm -hmm. more specifically, you know, results model, just the importance of results and some reflections on that. Yeah. Well, you know, I am so much less worried than many people are about the echo chamber, this idea that we have to talk to people who don't share our views. And I, you know, what I've seen in my life with progressive social movements is we don't need a majority of people. Um, mm. We don't need a majority of people. You need vocal and strategic people who are fighting for the right things. And I am not going to spend a lot of time, you know, with a MAGA person. I'm just not, I don't think I'm going to be mm -hmm. able to change that person. But when it's about healthcare coverage for that person, I want that person to get covered. And my work is going to benefit that person. And so I think it's, it's good to grow the movement. And I, you know, I used to, and even Paul used to lecture in, in a lecture halls with two people. That doesn't happen anymore. We have a great, solid, fantastic movement. We've brought in an array of voices. I think diversity is very important. It's important to have people who are from poor communities, from wealthy communities, from the global South, the global North. A diversity is important. But ideology, you know, there is a specific thing that we want, which is justice and fairness and equity. And so those things to me are kind of non-negotiable and uh, I'm not too worried that this group here may be small, 
because small groups of people, I mean, that's that famous Margaret Mead quote, right? Mm -hmm. It never doubt that a small group of, you know, people can change the world. Indeed, that's all that ever has. So if you look at any social movement from the civil rights movement in the United States, movement to abolish the transatlantic slave trade, these were tiny groups of people, but they're on the right side of history. So I think you know, encouraging your friends to join, reaching out to people is great, it's important, but I don't think we have to worry that everyone needs to be convinced. And if that's your bailiwick to convince your neighbor who is very right wing, okay, you know, I'm not gonna do it. You know, I, that's not what I'm good at. Um, and so my lane, and we can all have different lanes too, right? My lane is to really work with progressives and talk to the people who may want to uh, change things and they need more information. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's, uh, I don't worry too much about our movement. I mean, we need it to grow it, but we don't need to grow it at all costs and we can't compromise on the fundamental values. Thanks, Joy. I, I, you know, the great thing about results volunteers is we go deep. <laughs> I've yes. seen the power of it. I've seen the power yeah. of one letter to like really change the world, frankly, delivered to the right person and amplified in the right way. Yeah. So we do have a question from Mercy in the chat box and encourage others because we do have some yeah. time. So let's take advantage of having this brilliant, amazing woman on the call with us. But so Mercy says, Joya, how about the, how about the power of how do you counteract, I think, is what she's saying, the power of decision making and uh, of, of the resources being used and controlled by the other side of the equation, the opposite. Yeah, view. I mean, and, and these are, yeah, that's a great question, Marcy. Thank you for asking that. And that, to me, this is about the tactical choices we make, right? It's not about the moral choices we make. So our moral choice is justice, equity, human rights, right? But then what are the tactics we need? So, I mean, sometimes the tactics are, very in the weeds. I mean, Joanne Carter is so brilliant at this, knowing exactly what bill, exactly what legislative person is going to mark up that bill. I mean, that's a tactic, right? Another tactic is people standing up, you know, and we've seen this with the HIV movement. We saw that when our current um, administration in the United States tried to reverse the Affordable Care Act. It was probably 3,000 people who stopped that right? And many of them were disabled people, yeah. um, but they put their bodies on the line. Uh, we see this with the protests against tar sands pipelines. And so that these are tactics, but not all tactics are, you know, you need a sign. Some tactics are, you know, testifying before parliament. Some tactic, tactic, tactics are finding the right people. So I think that's what all of you have the capacity to do is think about those tactics. And then as a group, plan what those are. Are they related to individual decision makers? Are they related to popular protest? Are they related to voting? I mean, you know, in our country, in my country, if we don't vote this particular administration out, like we will have failed because that has to be pro like top of mind for most of the progressive agendas. Um, but you know, there, there are many different ways to approach it. So I think honing on the values, seeing where is it we wanna go and then deciding what are the tactics that, that you can do, that you have the power to do. Um, and that are going to, you know, move you along and bringing other people into that. Yeah, I think it's just a multiplicity of tactics. Sometimes I call it lining up the dominoes, but line them yes. all up and keep going, yes. right? Yes. Um, just wondering if we have any other, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, here's one. Um, uh, Elizabeth writes, Joya, thanks so much for being here. I'm concerned about the recovery narrative. It's, yeah. It is currently about economics, and that's partially because um, we can quickly measure economics, purchasing, employment, all of that stuff, even transit use. How do we use the crisis moment to educate decision makers about the importance of economics and social and environmental and yeah. et cetera to recovery and ultimately about resilience in a society? It's a great question. That is a great question. I think that's the operative question for all of us as progressives over the next six months to a year to two years. We have to make this not about COVID. Um, it has to be about health justice, racial justice, economic justice, climate justice, right? We have to, and I've, you know, been encouraged, I don't know if any of you are involved, you know, in the LEAP 
organization there in Canada, but I, I think these kind of discussions of intersectionality, of race, class, environment, um, health, education are so critical. Um, and I don't know how to broker that, but I am looking to mm -hmm. make lots of alliances. I mean, that's why I'm talking with you guys today. That's why, you know, we will need an army of people to see this uh, and on, I think many people do. So it's like how to put the right people in power. I mean, you know, there are progressive people. And if you look at the role of women in this epidemic around the world and even women's leadership from, you know, um, New Zealand to Iceland to the, you know, there, there are many great lessons that we can learn here. Um, but I think this intersectional argument has got to be what comes out of this. Um, it's a big lift. I mean, I can say from Ebola, and this is why I'm super afraid of biosecurity as this very narrow lens, but it didn't help us at all make the larger argument with Ebola. And so we need to make that larger argument. Whereas again, with AIDS, we made the larger argument of treatment access and human rights, right? And access to healthcare in general. So, uh, and LGBTQ rights. So I think we need to think about this uh, very, very seriously. Building bridges, not building walls. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and and w what's the coalition yeah. for, you know, a really sort of different future? Jay, I think this is the, there, there's, this is, there's a few more uh, questions in the chat room. I think one about, about is the next step, you know, vaccine, is there a vaccine? Is there something else other than that? Um, you know, th those sorts of pieces that are very medical, I guess on that, before we move to the very last question, yeah. you know, just maybe a, a, a couple of thoughts on the vaccines, diagnostic therapeutics discussion is ongoing, but it's not just about the things, is it? It's about the people that implement those things. Yes. And then it's about access and public yeah. good. Yeah. Right. So I don't think the vaccine is near. Um, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I used to work in an AIDS immunology lab in 1997, where everyone said a vaccine was two years away. So I think we've got to proceed as if that that is not, you know, for just sheltering in place for that, like I, I'm worried. Um, yeah. And I think you're absolutely right, Christina, that whatever we fight for, we have to fight for equity and the people power to do it. Because if we had more people on the front lines, community health workers, for example, um, in the US, uh, you know, nurses, and they had the right equipment, this would not be the crisis that it is. And if people had the right social protection, which they clearly don't in the United States. True that so, and true globally, for sure. Yeah, so I think we shouldn't act as if the, the vaccine is you know, a year away. And if we get surprised, awesome. And we'll fight like hell to make sure that gets distributed equally. Um, and I want to answer this question on where is the environmental aspect? I think it's a couple of different things. When we look at COVID, it is a zoono zoonotic disease as is Ebola, which means it jumps from humans to or from animals to humans. And we know that those kind of diseases are more common with the destruction of the environment. They're more common with people living in overcrowded conditions. So the very deforestation, um, overcrowding, lack of adequate housing, that environmental stress will lead to more of these pandemics. Travel is also another important thing. And I'm a frequent flyer, of, of, yeah. but we've got to really rethink uh, some, of, some of those things. And, you know, how food is grown and distributed. These are all ways that we think we're at risk for pandemics. And so um, linking the environmental causes. And then I would say that people, again, in the global south, who are sitting ducks for the effects of climate change, um, agriculturalists, subsistence farmers, who are gonna be much, much more at risk for these things because of chronic malnutrition and drought. Um, and so I think climate has just, a, again, a very large intersectional impact on risk for infection or pandemics. Um, the, the, the risk of them occurring, risk of people getting them who are poor, and risk of them having a poor outcome because of these other environmental factors. So um, 
it that's why this intersectional approach is so important and bringing many many people in thank you thank you for that so just you know one final word uh joya do you have do you have one piece of wisdom to share with all of these amazing people who have joined the call our members and I our mean, volunteers really just thank you thank you what you do is important grassroots work solidarity fighting the fight uh is just really, really important. And we have relied on results for decades to be a champion for things that many people just don't pay any attention to. You know, I remember um, many years ago getting called by a reporter during the SARS epidemic. And, you know, there were 600 deaths from SARS. Yeah. And the reporter said, you know, Dr. Mukherjee, there's this, you know, SARS and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, look, I take care of an airborne infection that affects 1.8 billion people on the planet. And they're like, really, what's that? And I said, tuberculosis, and the guy's like, oh, you know, I mean, people don't care. So your work is very important, your voice is very important, and it's an honor for, for us at PIH to work with all of you. It's our honor, PIH's commitment and strength and conviction and partnership, it's really, it helps serve as an antidote to despair for all of us. So okay. we're really deeply appreciative, you know, PIH Canada and Mark Brender, who's the, the ED there is on the line too. I'm encouraging all of my Canadian counterparts to look up that website and look up Mark, but thank okay. you, Joya. Thank, thank you so you. much for great everything. Meeting. Great. Bye. Everybody, this is how we okay. applause and thank you, Joya. silence. Thank you so much, Joya. Thank you very much, Joy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. That was awesome. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I'm going to pass it back over to you. Okay, I've got myself unmuted now. So thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Joya. Uh, we're going to start the formal business part of the AGM now. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris to start off with her executive director report. Thanks. And Randy, just so your, your camera's off too. But. So maybe we'll just thank you for that musical introduction. I really appreciate that, whoever that was. So thanks. Thank you, everybody. Um, so just a few words for me. So, so in thinking about how to frame this ED report, I thought it was important to acknowledge, you know, again, what we were just talking about this in this deeply complex and challenging times in which we find ourselves as individuals and as communities and as a country and as a world, like they're the times that have the potential to really blur vision. And, and that's hard when clarity of focus and longer sight lines you know, really seem more important than ever. And as the weeks pass, it's really become so much more crystal clear that no one will be untouched by this, the consequences of this pandemic, none of us. But moreover, as we heard from Dr. Mukherjee, the impact will be especially felt in, you know, lower income countries and communities where poverty is already uh, breeding illness and disease and straining budgets and stretching health systems. And the health, the, on the health impacts, um, we know that the economic consequences are going to be immense, especially those who for uh, I was on a call this morning and Tedros, the head of the WHO was on it. He said for those whose daily bread depends on their daily labor. Um, I that connected with me, but also at a time when the me first movement, as I was talking about with with Dr. Mukherjee that we spoke about earlier has the potential to really constrain aid flows even more and undermine, you know, that sense of global solidarity that results in all of you stand for. So the global challenges are daunting, but they do shine a spotlight on the world we have and the world we need, and one that's better equipped to mitigate the impact of all of these things that we fight against at times of crisis, but at all times. And that's where results comes in. And all of our amazing grassroots volunteers, and many of you, and even in challenging times, you advocate for results to be a real leader, a lighthouse uh, in a raging storm. And over the last year, our work has really, you know, been paying off. Too often it seems that results were in such a hurry to rack up the wins that we just don't take stock of the accomplishments enough. And so this is a moment to do that. And, and they've been really, there, there have been many, even in the last year. $930.4 million from Canada last August to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS to be in malaria just last month with work that began in 2019, a pledge from Canada of 600 million for the Global Vaccines Alliance or Gavi, uh, $190 million for the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. You know, those are 
really impressive dollar amounts, but as you know, it's what's behind the dollars that really matter. Our Global Fund pledge alone is going to contribute to 16 million lives saved and countless millions more families who will be spared the impact and hardships of disease and preventable illness. And the Gavi pledge is going to contribute to vaccinating 300 million more children, saving 7 million lives, and Canada's contribution to GPI, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, will mean that we'll not relent on a commitment to see polio eradicated, even in the face of COVID. This is the only, it's the second time, as many of you know, in history that the world has wiped out an infectious disease off the planet a feat that has particular resonance, I would say, right now. And while we've done this, we've strengthened our organization in meaningful ways. We launched a new brand, a new look, new tools, and a new action-oriented website. We've generated revenue by building out a new earned revenue model. It's about providing advocacy services to others like -minded, who have like-minded missions um, so that while we support our own organization, we're also building out advocates in theirs and also advocates generally and also having impact. Uh, we brought up par our parliamentary engagement to a new level. And if you haven't seen it, Lindsay will throw our parliamentary year in review for 2019 in the chat window. And with all of this, and because of it, we've been seeing a steady stream of new volunteers participating in person and through our new online community. And it's thrilling and inspiring to have a front row seat to the impact you achieve when you push yourselves to be bold. Uh, bold like Nina, who pushed, uh, published her first letter to the editor in the Ottawa Citizen some weeks ago after being coached by Sherry, who's a longtime volunteer, and bold like AJ, who scored his first meeting over Zoom, no less, with his MP. Uh, bold like Nora from Calgary, who had letters published not only in the Toronto Sun, but in the Guardian, the same letter, a double bang for the buck, which was pretty awesome. And those are just a few names. There's so many more names of, of all of you who make up results powerful family of advocates. And finally, we built up an exceptional team of board and staff, many of whom are on this call. Our board is going to be introduced later, but I'd love to take this moment to have our staff somehow in all of these little square boxes of windows raise your hands and to acknowledge the hard work and commitment of Taryn, Lisa, Tessa, Melissa, Lindsay, Robin, Kenneth, Briar, and introduce our newest addition, Hamish, who has been on the job all of a week and has no idea what he's gotten himself into yet, but I promised him it would be fun. And now as we look ahead, even as times are chaotic and blurred, we can invigorate, be invigorated by, I think, what is a clarity of mission, uh, where progress is measured for results in lives saved and more children accessing education and greater economic inclusion. Um, and we're fueled and inspired by our volunteers, like you, who are empowered and powerful. And for those who may still be on the call but who are not your volunteers, we encourage you to join us. If Melissa hasn't put the link to the webs in the chat box yet, then I'm sure she will. Because the the change, because changing the world, the world is changing and changing the world is, um, is not only inc incredibly fulfilling, it's also fun. Um, so with that, I'll close and thank you for your support and obviously open up to any questions that you might have for me. All right, folks, fire away. <laughs> Make them easy. <laughs> Lisa, Chris, maybe, would, uh, uh, sorry, Lisa, maybe you can unmute everyone. We're going to need that for the business part of the meeting anyway. So, I had a question, Chris. I was, uh, how, how, is, how have things gone for you uh, the last, uh, what, what are we in, uh, two months now of COVID? And um, you, I was very impressed with the, with the um, document you, you developed right at the start of this to lay out the processes to deal with COVID among, within the results organization and just curious how that's gone for you and how, uh, how everyone's doing. You know, I, thanks for the question. I, I feel like we have a really resilient team and having worked globally for all of these years and we're probably more equipped than a lot of organizations, right, in the world to, to be online and to kind of work remotely because we're used to communicating with folks in Kenya and India. And so for those of us who might be, you know, neighborhoods away this is we're just we're just working digitally but i would say you know it's actually been okay i feel like the team has just risen to the occasion it's you know if anything people are working harder than ever there's a lot going on right now and of course more need for results than ever at this point um so so thank you for the question but i think i think we've managed the transition to that okay and in terms of 
forward looking pieces. There's plenty of work to keep us busy in terms of our mission. So. Thanks, Chris. I just wanted to uh, call out all the all, all the results um, staff and volunteers for the great work uh, again this year and really proud of the organization. Thank you, Dave. David's a member of our board for those who, are, who don't know. Chris, I have a question for you. Sure. It's German. Um, what is the biggest challenge you're facing right now as a, as a nonprofit, but also as an advocacy group? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's the organizational challenges, which will be that people suggest, you know, donations might go down or it might be a more constrained resource environment to fuel your organization. Um, we haven't seen that, but of course we're mindful of it. I think the bigger challenge is really, it's, it's a complex time and you know, you know results. Results is always looking for the biggest impact, the trim tab, the opportunity for leverage. And there's just, there's so many weeds right now. And cutting through those weeds to have some clarity of vision in terms of where the biggest opportunities are, I think that's, that's where the biggest challenge is. But again, you know, uh, um, uh, Taryn is our campaigns director. She's ably leading the team through that sort of process. And we're really working hard to, to understand where, the, where, where those opportunities are. So I think, I think that's the challenge is that things are unsettled. But I do think we're well positioned to sort of find our way through all of that and, and still continue to make impact for sure. Um, it's Michael. <clears throat> uh, Chris, I, um, well, I mean, it, it, the results family has been very familiar with pandemics for many years now, um, even though maybe not of the magnitude that we have right now. Um, I mean, we, we did get this uh, Gavi and uh, PEI uh, or polio <clears throat> funds for, from the government. What has been some of your feelings in the last uh, at least you know, few weeks, if not months, about the understanding, especially within the government circles? I, I, I'm just hoping that you've been here in some time. Um, because this has been at the center for us for many years, like vaccines. Um, the, are you hearing new vibes? Do you get, you know, some kind of an understanding about, about this and what we do in connection to that? Michael, I, Michael M. Bai, everybody is also a member of the results board. So thank you for the question, Michael. I, um, I, f I, I feel like we have allies in government who understand, I think here's the biggest tension. The biggest tension from my perspective in terms of an all of government piece is what I talked to Dr. Mukherjee about, which is that a global problem demands a global solution and that aid matters and aid is fuel and that Canada's role in the world is more important than ever, particularly in the face of what's going on south of the border. And that means that Canada has to step up. Canada has to step up where ODA was already one of the lowest um, the OECD, like very low in terms of OECD, as you all know, and we have not increased it. But there is a tension about domestic response and global, and it's a false dichotomy. It's, it is buying into that sense of scarcity, I, I believe. But we have to be cognizant of that in our government relations and in our advocacy in terms of, um, you know, framing smart asks that make sense and understand who it is that we're addressing and what their challenges are. That's the best kind of advocacy and results engages in that is understanding and meeting people where they are and then moving them forward in the direction that we want them to go. I don't think it's unique to results, but it is sort of a, a phenomenon that's a challenge for everybody, I think, right now working in the space. We take for granted because we're results folks that the global <laughs> is the obvious and it's, and it's not to so many, as you know, even in your own mm -hmm. families and your neighborhoods. What, what I was trying to say is basically, do you see any sign or do you get any sense as a result of this unfortunate situation that our job may be easier, that there is probably a little bit more understanding is what I was leading to? Well, and I don't think my answer didn't, like, I, I don't think it's going to be easier. I think it's always going to be a challenge for lots of reasons. And, uh, but there are always openings and entry points. I keep talking about that Leonard Cohen song that says there's a crack in everything and that's how the light shines in. We need to take advantage of this to be able to tell and change the narrative so that, so that we're able to kind of make progress. I don't think it's easier though, Michael. I think that these are challenging times everywhere all around for whether you're an advocate or an implementing organization. Um, Chris, I have another question. 
one, uh, any, one, one we, last question, and then we'll move on to the uh, to the rest of the meeting. Thanks. I have another question. Sure. Um, regarding um, where is the need you feel that your organization needs to move forward, like whether it's financial, whether it's advocacy, whether it's government relations, where is that need that you feel that results needs to have like in opened or connections to gain the traction it needs to advocate the change they want? We need people. We need to build our movement. It's now it's more important than absolutely any ever before. And I think the value proposition and what results brings to the table is deep, deep bench strength advocacy. And we have the tools and we have the people and we're growing, but we need to grow more because it's not about a few staff in Ottawa making a difference. It's not even about the volunteers. We, we want to kind of spread the word. And it's not only the get of that is not only increased impact in the world, it's also lighting more people up to be advocates so that they can affect change and they can also make a difference. There's two parts to our mission. And that's what we need. We need you to help us spread the word. We need to get the word out and we need to build our movement. And I think that's where the real opportunities are and also uh, where we need to put some emphasis and, and where we have been and where we need to continue to be. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chris. Thanks, thanks everybody. Your, yeah, thanks for all the questions, appreciate it. So um, for the remainder of the business meeting, um, we need to have a minimum of 10 members on the call uh, who are able to uh, pass motions. I think we had about 20 members. Uh, register, so I think we're we're good to go there. Um, and uh, for those who weren't able to attend, uh, Ainsley Morris, our secretary, uh, has received uh, proxies if there were any, and they'll be considered as part of the voting as well. So to get the the business meeting started, if Janice Burke, our treasurer, is on uh, to talk about the financial statements and to present them. So Chris, you wanted to pop up a, uh, a slide, I think, as well, did you? Or are you talking to them? And Chris is muted nicely. Well done. So are you are you talking to it, Chris, or is uh, Janice going to? I think you were going to gonna talk to it, weren't you? Or? No, I you're in the. <laughs> Hi. No, I, I was not prepared to, to talk to them at this point, but. Sorry, I'm just going to call up the slide. Yeah, slides. call up the slide. Can you see my shared screen? Yeah. Forgive me here as I'm trying to navigate this. So Chris is going to pull up the uh, the slide on here, and it, uh, yeah, there we go. So it just shows uh, very. Um, uh, at a high level where our revenue and uh, expenses were. Um, again, most of our revenue this year um, is in expenses and most is in staff costs as most of our costs are either our staff doing work in the field or advocating on behalf of the organization. Uh, so that's fairly straightforward. Um, what I did want to, well, and I think you see uh, you know, uh, a slight loss this year. Um, that is primarily due to, I think, two things. One is the timing of some of our expenses and uh, revenue. So we've we've paid for some things in advance. Um, I think that's the uh, uh, the bulk of the reason for the for the slight. Um, uh, difference between the two. The other thing I want to add, though, which isn't shown on these uh, slides, is that we've had a, a thorough review on, on the board, that is, we've had a, a thorough review of our balance sheet this year. And we've done a fair amount of uh, review of our cash flow. And from that perspective, we're in quite a strong position, actually. Uh, and that came as a as you know, very good news to all of us, and it follows from what the auditors have been saying for the last couple of years. So we were able to confirm that. So the res the, the organization is doing well, um, and um, our auditors. I'm going to say one more thing. Our auditors also looked at. They're required to look at the potential impact of 
of COVID or any other uh, impacts to the future uh, stability of the organization. And when they looked at um, where we are standing and what our projections are for our revenues and expenses in the coming year as well, uh, they agreed that this was not a, uh, a significant impact to the organization. So I think we'll be doing well in 2020 as well. So that's all I have to say about the financials. Anybody have any questions? For James? Randy, Randy, <laughs> uh, Randy, I have a question regarding the financials. Yeah. It's German. Um, were, there, were there any issues that were identified in the audit? Uh, no, no. Or, no. Okay. No. There, it's a, what's the word? Con, not a conditional audit. Uh, the, like many nonprofits. Uh, qualified. My, <clears throat> a qualified opinion. Yeah. And that's okay. because they don't, uh, the auditors don't have the ability to go through all of the donations that we receive. Uh, they review the grants, but they can't review all of the, all of the sort of cash transactions and, and therefore the, uh, the, it's a qualified audit. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so we're going to now um, go into the motion part of, um, of the meeting. And so rather than me asking for all in favor, I'm just going to ask if there's any opposed. And um, so if you aren't opposed, keep silent and uh, we'll, we'll pass them that way. Cause I don't know how many of you are actually going to be voting on the call. Okay, so, um, can I ask for a motion uh, from the members to approve the financial statements that were presented? Hello, this is Anita Mark in Victoria. Um, I move that the financial statements be adopted as presented. Thanks, Anita. Is there a seconder? My name is Cassandra Arnold. I second the motion. Thanks very much. So, any opposed to the motion? Hearing no opposition, we'll count that as passed. Thanks. Um, so uh, we're, we're now going to move on to electing directors and we'll start with, um, so all of you have been uh, emailed the proposed slate and their bios and we haven't received any further nominations. So I'm going to start off with the returning board members who I think are on that slide right. So they are Racima Alam, Janice Burke, Clarisha Christie, David Kahn, Michael Embai, Ainsley Morris, Jean-Michel Laurent, Michael Luft, Elizabeth Dove, and uh, I'm on that list too. So there they are. And we have four new uh, board members as well for this year. And they are Jennifer Wani, Cherie Kirkby, Janet Butler McPhee, and Emeril Hassan. So could I have a motion to accept these individuals as directors of results? My name is uh, Jean-Francois Tardif, and I move that Racima Alam, Janice Burke, Kralisha, Kralisha Christie, sorry, David Kahn, Michael Embai, Ainsley Morris, Jean-Michel Lorrain, Michael Luft, Elizabeth Duff, Jennifer Wani, Sherry Kirkby, Janet Buckram McPhee, Emerald Hassan, and Randy Rudolph be approved as directors of results. Thanks, Jeff. Is there a seconder? My name Jennifer. is Michael Embai, and I second the motion. Thanks, Michael. Uh, any opposed? Great. Hearing no opposition, we'll count that as a pass as well. So our final obligation um, at the AGM is the appointment of auditors. And can I ask for a motion in that respect, please? Hi, my name is German Voon, and I move that Renew Williams Kears Freshman 
LLP of Ottawa be appointed as the auditors for results for the financial year ending December 31st, 2020. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, is there a seconder? Jeanette Aubin. Jeanette? I, I'll second it. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, that's passed as well. Okay, so that completes the formal part of the AGM. So before we ask for an adjournment, um, just as chair of the board, I'd like to re uh, reflect actually what uh, David Kahn said earlier, that I want to thank our staff, especially all of our volunteers, our board members who don't get uh, a lot of thank, uh, thankful praise most of the time, all of our partners in the organization and all of our donors as well for continued uh, dedication to results mission. I think we need to, um, as we found out this year, and I think as we have heard from Joya tonight as well, we need to continue to speak out in support of a healthier, equitable, and more resilient world for all of us. So thank you again, and thanks for your ongoing yeah. support. Thank you, Randy. If I can just thank you all too, and just um, Melissa's asking, or somebody's asking, if we can get a screen, a picture, if people are okay with getting a shot, a photo, so that we can sure. uh, acknowledge that this has been a great call. So put on your Show your show your smiling faces. That would Put on be your great. video. Right. <laughs> I, I haven't had a haircut in four months. Or so. I know. We, <laughs> we, 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 all, we all we all have you know that either. liberal shaggy dog look, don't we? <laughs> Trudeau as well. Well, we're multi-partisan. We're multi-partisan. Trudeau as well. Yes, we are. <laughs> Lead by example. Yeah. Okay. I'll, small I'll, liberal. I'll count you guys down to a to a smile. So ready? One, two, three. Uh, all right, and I'm just gonna get uh, screen number two because there's a there's a whole bunch of you. All right, so we're gonna do this one more time on three, one, two, three. <laughs> Super, thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Back to you. Will you send those out or tweet those out or? Yeah, we will. Okay, great. Okay, <laughs> great. So with that, can I get someone to adjourn the meeting, please? Um, my name is Rochelle Fillard in Toronto, and I move to adjourn the meeting. Thanks, Rochelle. <laughs> is there a seconder? Hi, I'm Rachel Manier, and I second the motion. Hey, Rachel, thanks very much. All right, that's carried. No need to vote on that one. Thank you all very much for attending. It's great to see so many of you on the call. It's been a real thrill. So I do want to, there, there is a board meeting uh, after this, so I'm encouraging all of our board members to log off of this one and in, well, immediately, I guess, like in about two yeah. minutes, we'll, we'll log into the, uh, to the board call. So that's a different number. <clears throat> Look for that in your, uh, in your meeting. So thanks very much everyone for attending again. Great seeing you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. everybody. Good job. Bye, Good job. Thanks, Randy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. For all your hard work. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.